Before the meeting, before the meeting is called to order, I would like to point out a few house rules to assist council members, staff, and members of the public to successfully participate in this meeting. Council members, your microphone is live, so please keep your microphones on mute until you wish to speak. For tonight's meeting, we are using Zoom to host the city council regular meeting. At the bottom of, bottom of the Zoom client, there are two icons, chat and raise hand. Please use chat only to report technical issues such as being unable to hear a council member speaking. Please use raise hand to be recognized by the mayor and enable to speak to the council. To comment under oral communication or on any agenda item, you are allowed three minutes to speak per agenda item. Emails limited to 350 words can be submitted to the city clerk and it will be read into the record. This word limit is set to hear the typical three minute time allowance. Only attendees using the Zoom application can use the raise hand option to comment. Participants calling in from your telephone will only be able to listen and cannot provide feedback or public comment. Lastly, because we are all not in the same room, all votes at this meeting will be taken by you. Thank you. Um, I'm now calling the City Council meeting of the City of Monte Serino for Tuesday, August 17th, 2021 to order. Roll call, please. Councilmember Waller. Present. Councilmember Mekicek will be joining us later. Uh, Councilmember Turner. Here. Mayor Patamalahi. Here. And Mayor Newfold. Present. And we have a quorum. Thank you. Um, I have not received any requests for changes to the orders of the day. Uh, unless Mr. Leonardis or Ms. Radcliffe speak up, I will um, assume there are none. We have no presentations. So we now move to the oral communications section of the calendar. Oral communications is a time for members of the public who wish to uh, be recognized and speak on matters which are not on the agenda this evening to uh, be recognized for three minutes to speak to council. If we have any members of the public who wish to speak to us on matters not on the agenda, please raise your hand to be recognized. Seeing none, we will close oral communications and move to written communications. Ms. Radcliffe, have there been any written communications that have not reached the packet? No. Thank you. Moving now to the consent calendar. The consent calendar is a group of actions which will be uh, taken uh, for a consent vote unless someone wishes to uh, pull an item for discussion. Uh, that can be either a council member or a member of the public. If there are simply brief questions about items on the consent calendar by council um, or members of the public, uh, if they uh, feel so inclined, uh, we can address those without pulling it from uh, the matter from the consent calendar. So at this time, I will open the matters on the consent calendar, item one and two, which is the warrant list and the updated ad hoc committee appointments uh, to public comment. If we have any members of the public wishing to speak on the consent calendar, please raise your hand to be recognized. Seeing none, we will close public comment on the consent calendar and uh, move now to question, uh, brief questions on the consent calendar. Uh, if there are any council members who wish to have an item pulled rather than a simple uh, question, please uh, speak up and do that. Otherwise, we'll move to questions. Any uh, council member questions on the items on the consent calendar? Uh, I'll move to adopt the, uh, approve the consent calendar. Uh, too quick, um, Mayor Pro Malahi, I have a question. Um, so uh, I, I did want to... Uh, direct a question to staff regarding the warrant list. Um, and I don't know if this is for uh, Mr. Samaranos or uh, Mr. Leonardis to respond, whoever uh, can provide the input. My question has disappeared underneath my Zoom link. Sorry, hold on a second while I get to the right calendar and my question so I can speak to it appropriately. Sure, it's, it's yeah. One more second while I pull that up. Warrant list. Okay. So on the warrant list, my question for uh, whoever is most capable of answering it, uh, this um, is uh, two items actually. One is the building plan checks, $37,600. Um, is this just for a one month period? And if so, 
Why is it so extremely and outrageously high? Uh, that's twice what it would cost to have a full-time employee on staff conducting that work. And possibly related, possibly separate, separate items, CSG consultants, temporary city engineering services, $20,495. Also, uh, if what period of time, if that's more than a month, that's at least 1.5 times a full-time employee. Um, how is that justified? And what are we doing to make sure uh, that this is addressed and or never happens again? So uh, Mr. Leonardis or Mr. Samaranos, any input on those two questions? Mayor Leohold, uh, I have the answer to that. Uh, regarding the Alana Consulting building plan checks, yes, that is not for one month. It is for approximately two to three months of work performed by the uh, building plan checker. Um, regarding the CSG Consulting of 20000 that includes a bill uh, for the temporary city engineer that we had a few months back when our Jessica Kahn was on uh, maternity leave. And so part of that uh, expense includes that. If you need to know the specific amount for the temporary city engineer, I can look it up here since I have all the invoices in front of me. Okay, um, I think your explanation uh, at least answers my questions. I just, uh, I was hoping that that would be the answer that we weren't talking about a single month. Um, and that somehow these had simply gotten grouped together. Uh, so we were seeing a larger than, uh, than normal monthly number. I assume that when we come to the budget report, he'll let us know where we are in terms of the overall budget, but that's not on for tonight. So my yes. questions have been answered. Um, I appreciate the input. And if I have any further specific questions or wanna take a look at the invoices, I'll send you an email. And by the way, um, just so you know, because these are expenses, the temporary city engineer was an expense that incurred uh, last fiscal year. We will be accruing that expense against last year's uh, uh, budget. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the explanation. Uh, with uh, those answers, any further questions from council? If not, we will entertain Mr. Alahi's motion to adopt the consent calendar. Would you like to um, formalize that motion, Mr. Alahi? I, I move to have the consent calendar adopted. And I'll second. Ms. Turner seconds. Uh, roll call vote, please, Ms. Radcliffe. Council Member uh, Waller? Yes. Council Member Turner? Yes. Council Member Katambalahi? Yes. And Mayor Lincoln? Yes. And that motion passes. Thank you very much. Okay, moving now to public hearings. Uh, there is no unfinished business. So moving to item one on the new business, this is discuss uh, regarding returning to in-person city council meetings and providing direction to staff. Um, let's go ahead and uh, get the staff report before we open to public comment. Uh, so is that uh, Mr. Leonardis? Go ahead. Yes, thank you, Mayor. As you all know, our last meeting was in March of 20. Seems like a long time ago. Since then, we've been hosting Zoom meetings which have been efficient in some ways, but there's pros and cons to Zoom. And as we're coming out of the pandemic, it's time to kind of ease back into normalcy, the way we used to do things. Cities are starting to uh, go back to their live meetings. I think Los Gatos, their first live meeting is either tonight or next, next meeting. Um, the governor has the Brown Act suspension order all the way through September 30th. Staff would recommend we go back live on October 5th, although we're more than capable of going live again. We have a brand new camera system and some things in our um, a way to record the meetings and upload them directly to the YouTube channel. We have all these great things we've been dying to try out for over a year now. But um, there has been you know, some recent um, concern about the Delta virus and those types of things. I did consult with our um, IT professional, they came up with a number of options on how we can conduct some hybrid type meetings if council desires, kind of easing back into the in-person meetings. I'll go over those um, options in a moment. Um, there are, should be considered, if we do go back to in-person meetings, do we also have the commissioners for the Better Streets, the Site and Arc, 
the youth commissioners also come back to live meetings. And then there is um, Mr. Rudin, and I will let him speak for himself. Um, if you know he would like to participate remotely as a staff member, I believe he has a long commute now. So those are some points to consider as well. Regarding our options, uh, to go back to you know, what I would consider a hybrid meeting, could have council members use their city issued iPads with their built-in cameras plus earbuds and continue to conduct the meetings via Zoom, but in the council chamber, members of the public could still remotely participate via Zoom. That would be one option. If we had members of the public on site, we could have a single iPad laptop set up so each member of the public wishing to speak can address everybody via Zoom, whether they are on site or remote. So in other words, uh, at the podium where they would ordinarily speak, have an iPad there, and then members who Zoom into the meeting from the public can witness them their comments. We can have a full on-site or combination meeting um, with the iCompass live stream system with a simultaneously secondary Zoom meeting that would be monitored for members of the public and remote staff wishing to speak. That would be another option. Um, we can have a hybrid slash classroom set up with cameras pointing at the council and one pointing at the audience if on site via Zoom. So in other words, um, we have one camera on the, on the council, one on the audience if they show up, but we can have that be zoomed out and have the council in the chambers. Last but not least, there's a device called an OWL, which is like a speaker that sits on a desk with a camera. And that device can, I, I hate to use this reference, but think of Charlie's Angels and the speaker and they get in the room and they all speak to it, except it would have a camera on it so we can all be seen. Um, we remember that old show, Charlie's Angels, the speaker on the desk. And um, our IT person is on with us. Of course, he may be able to comment more on how that can work, but I, I use those in the past. Just the speaker version, not the one with the camera, but now they have one outfitted with a camera. That concludes my comments, and I am available for questions, as well as, like I said, our IT professional, Mr. Dave Kizon is here, and Mr. Rudin may want to comment as well on his um, situation. Again, nothing has to be done before September 30th. Staff recommends we, whatever we decide to do, we should consider doing um, at the October 5th meeting. And it would be based on, of course, the Governor's Brown Act order. And okay. I'll jump in here and um, sort of summarize what the regulatory requirements are on the city with respect to meetings. Um, you know, assuming that the uh, executive order that uh, um, is set to expire on September 30th does expire, uh, the regular Brown Act requirements with respect to meetings and teleconferencing go into effect. Um, and while the city council and council members can still participate entirely remotely, um, yeah, that comes with some caveats. The Brown Act would require that we no, list the location where all the council members are participating from in the agenda and that those locations be quote unquote made available to the public. Um, so, you know, uh, in the past, I have dealt with council members participating remotely from their homes and, you know, their home address may be listed in the agenda or whatever other location they happen to be participating from. Now, obviously, some council members may have concerns about that. And then also in light of COVID, of course, unless the governor suspends that type of requirement to make your home available as a participation location, you know, I could also understand why council members may have concerns about that. Um, that being said, um, uh, if the council resumes, re re resumes and has in-person meetings where the council members show up and sit at the dais, uh, the Brown Act does allow the, the city provide additional opportunities for the public to participate remotely. So you would have both an in-person location, but you would also allow anybody who desires to participate via Zoom or via some sort of other call-in number or similar to the extent that, you know, the IT professional um, 
you know, and the city manager can make that work from a technical standpoint, there's no legal prohibition against that. Um, and certainly the city could encourage people to continue to participate remotely, even if council members are participating from the dais. Um, so that is that is a, a potential option for a hybrid meeting, uh, as the city manager just described. And then, you know, your third option, obviously, is you can come back to full in-person meetings, require everybody to show up, uh, don't provide any sort of uh, remote option for the public to participate, uh, which is how just about every public agency did it before, uh, you know, the pandemic. So um, all of these are options that are at your disposal. Um, and as the city manager mentioned, uh, you know, I, uh, I do now live in uh, the South Lake Tahoe area. So, you know, attending one of these meetings would be a, uh, you know, four hour round trip for me, uh, or sorry, a four hour each direction commute for me. Um, but I'm happy to continue doing it. Um, I just, you know, if there are hybrid options, I, I would love to be able to avail myself of those. Um, but if you, the council is going to require me to attend in person, um, I will make myself available to do so. I just need to work around some other scheduling issues, which we can discuss during the next agenda item. Thank you. Um, and I think um, our questions that we have are probably going to segue directly into our discussion. So actually, I'm going to ask council members to hold on questions, and I will hold on mine while I open this for public comment so that we can uh, get that cleared through, and then we can have our hybrid discussion of questions and comments at the same time as we hash this out. So um, seeing uh, if there are no objections from councils to that procedure, I will uh, move ahead with that. Seeing none, I will now open this to public comment. If there are any members of the public wishing to be heard on the subject of uh, the reconvening, uh, and moving uh, the transition back to in-person meetings and how that's handled, please raise your hand to be recognized at this time. Seeing none, we will close public comment and return this to uh, council member questions and comments. Uh, did we, um, I had one that I wanted to put out uh, first. And again, um, this is obviously dynamic and subject to the governor uh, potentially changing things. But Mr. Rudin, um, under my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that under normal rules, uh, it is required that a quorum be present uh, of the council at the chambers and that uh, up to two council members can participate remotely. But if we don't have a quorum in the chambers under the traditional rules, we can't go forward. Is that correct? Uh, no, I believe it's a quorum of the Council members must be within the jurisdiction. I'm just going to confirm that really quickly in the statute, um, and I will come back to that in a second. Okay, thank you. Um, any other um, questions or comments from council member? I know I have some, but um, I want to uh, go ahead and open this up to everyone else. So Ms. Luller, I saw your hand first. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, obviously, this is a big quandary. I know I'm ready to go back in person, but I, I think it obviously reflects how many council members are ready to do the same. And my, my point would be, it's kind of all or nothing. Um, I, I do want to keep the advantage of having the public be able to participate remotely. So if we are in chambers, I'd still like to be able to do that, as well as have Sergio be able to participate participate remotely. So however that looks, and as long as it's not confusing and it's efficient, right? So we're gonna need some guidance on that, I think from our IT guy as well. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Turner, you had your hand up. Uh, yes, uh, I, I know that Los Gatos tonight is having their meeting live and they also have two police officers there to monitor the, uh, the residents to make sure that when they go in, that they wear masks. And if they refuse, then they leave the premises. They cannot go in. So is that applicable for us to in all our meetings going forward? Yeah, and, and let me, um, I had the, exactly the same issue, Ms. Turner. Um, and so let me elaborate on that. And then um, we can get some input from Mr. Rudin who may be multitasking right now. Um, my understanding, and I believe it was um, Los Gatos' first experiment um, prior to this, was 
uh, that um, they had members of the public who refused to wear a mask, but did wish to be heard by counsel. And they had to make provision to have a podium outside. And I believe they, there was discussion about whether counsel was gonna march outside in order to listen to these um, people who insisted on not wearing masks and conducting a portion of the meeting outside. Uh, whether a better solution would be potentially, if we're required to do that, to have a, a Zoom connection outside so that council um, would take comment from members of the public who would somehow refuse to wear a mask but demand to be uh, addressing the council. So I think that that is the same issue and um, it might even um, come all the way to the level of having the police presence at the initial meetings if we're trying to enforce a mask mandate and potentially having uh, people disagreeing with that. Any input? And I, I, will, I will answer two questions now. Uh, one, I am confirmed that the statute requires a quorum of the members of the legislative body to participate from locations within the territory over which the local agency has jurisdiction. So within city limits. Um, the second uh, issue that you're raising with respect to masks is, um, you know, the answer is going to depend exactly on what mask mandates are in place at both the state and county level. Um, I am aware of certain councils that are going back to in-person meetings who are having their, um, you know, their local directors of emergency services adopt a mask mandate, a local mask mandate, a, a city mask mandate that can be enforced uh, so that they can require masking at their own local meetings. Um, you know, I am generally of the opinion that having a, a local mask mandate uh, is within the scope of the city's authority uh, with respect to, you know, access to its own facilities and access to its own meetings. Um, as a pragmatic uh, consideration, you know, there are a number of ways that you, um, you know, may need to provide some access to meetings to those who are who cannot uh, wear a mask for medical reasons or because of a disability. So, you know, the issue of having a podium outside or having some sort of other accommodation process um, is something that would need to be worked out with staff. And, you know, we would need to have a technical solution for that as well. All right. Thank you. Other questions? Comments? Yeah, Mr. Lahi. Thank you. Yeah, I guess we, we're going to have this discussion at some point, so this is a good time to have it. Uh, the governor's mandate might get extended, might not get extended, but uh, so it sounds like, as far as the city council is supposed, to, you know, we are we should be go, getting ready to go to in-person meetings, and uh, it'll be a good idea to provide some kind of accommodation for uh, the public to participate by Zoom or remotely. Uh, there was a number of options that uh, uh, City Manager Mr. Linares laid out, and uh, budget obviously would be a concern. I don't, I don't know how much one would cost compared to the other ones. If you could get some idea on what the different costs would be, then that would be helpful. Uh, also for uh, Mr. Rudin, I think uh, we can appreciate he's going to be in Tahoe and uh, it'll take him a while. But generally, in-person face-to-face uh, -face meetings would be helpful for our staffs especially we still have a very young staff and uh, maybe he could come down once a month or something and we could figure something out or at some other convenient time uh, so that uh, that process stays in place. Uh, I think it's too much to ask to do an eight hour trip for him. Uh, maybe the city can buy him a helicopter or something else so you can make it easier for him. But I, that, that would help. So I, I, I think we should plan on going to, uh, doing in-person meetings. I agree with council member Lawler. I think the, Meeting face to face really does help uh, the interface between the city city member council members and the staff. And uh, as far as the remote concern is is concerned, it's a good idea to have it. On the other hand, our city is really small, so it isn't like people are coming from fifty miles out to attend a city meeting. I mean, they're all within two miles, so it's not a huge burden on citizens if you can't provide them remote access. But it's you know it's a it's a good idea to at least be ready for that if we need to provide that. All right, thank you for the input. Um, any other council members wanting to add some comments? Otherwise, um, I'll add mine to the mix. Okay, uh, seeing none, um, I, I agree um, that with the comments that have been made, which is um, what I think I'm hearing that um, quite likely accommodating 
um, Mr. Rudin, other council members who need to appear remotely, um, and our citizens who may wish to or need to for health reasons or uh, just their own feelings of safety. Um, I think offering a hybrid, at least for a period of time, since we have the technology and we have the skills, uh, is certainly reasonable. Um, so I would think that staff can continue to research this as to what is going to be the most efficient, easily managed, easily controlled format um, for getting us back in, um, but still having public participation and remote participation when people need that. Um, I hear the hybrid Zoom meeting and the headphones um, may be a little bit kludgy, but that may be a, a good, easy way to do temporary transitional uh, without investing in a bunch of technology. So um, I don't have any problem with that or any of the other kind of combo solutions, um, but um, with responsiveness to both the cost and solving the problems for anybody who feels there is a problem. Um, Councilman Rilahi's comments of, that we are we are all close and, and requiring people to show up in person probably won't be a huge burden at some point. And maybe we want to go back to a somewhat more Luddite system for public comment and making people show up um, and, and see us face to face. Um, we certainly haven't had any problems with the Zoom uh, setup, but it does seem that we're not getting a lot of public participation. Uh, maybe it's just uh, this excellent council and staff doing their job very well um, and uh, not creating uh, the drama and the headaches. Uh, so uh, I'm only half joking about that. So. Um, I did, I'm all for keeping this as a uh, agenda item uh, to come forward and continue to talk about it as these options firm up based on what IT and, and what you, Mr. Leonardo and Mr. Rudin are suggesting will be most appropriate for us as things evolve. Uh, Ms. Lawler. Thank you. Yes, just really quickly, I think it's really important that we accommodate those citizens who are physically unable to attend meetings that might be of a certain age that makes it difficult for them. So it would be nice to be able to continue to have those kinds of accommodations as well. All right. Thank you. And Mr. Elahi. Yeah, I, I think that's a good concern. I mean, we are our citizens are, you know, in the, a lot of them are seniors and that 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 is a good, good comment. Uh, to take into account what, what i would suggest is if you're looking for these alternate uh, remote accesses uh, the, the initial consideration is the budget on doing it and the second consideration is we don't have you shouldn't set something up where we need a software guru sitting in the background at all times to make sure everything works you know try to come up with a process uh, solution that's simple enough so that uh, it flows fairly smoothly all right thank you good input um, Mr. Leonardis or Mr. Rudin or Mr. Kaisen, any um, further questions, comments, clarifications you want at this time, or are we good? Well, thank you, Mayor. Um, just if we can get direction when the council provides it on, you know, if regarding the commissioners' meetings, I think we got a pretty good idea of providing. It sounds like the council wants to come back on October fifth in person and um, provide the option for remote participation by residents. And we will find the most cost-effective way to do that. That's kind of the overall direction I've heard so far. And Mr. Rudin uh, will have the opportunity to participate remotely and perhaps in the not too distant future would maybe visit on a, you know once a month or something. That's the overall discussion I've heard so far. Sounds, sounds like a good summary. So, um, okay, well, and, and then yes, please feel free to um, continue to bring this back um, on future agendas as we fine tune this, uh, because I think we're gonna need um, to quite possibly adjust our, um, uh, not ordinance, but our uh, regulations regarding this for this as well as other items, so. Okay, uh, nothing further. Oh, Ms. Lawler has her hand up, it looks like. I, I do, I actually used my, my raise hand um, function today, but um, just, just to make a point, for obvious reasons, I think it's wise that whatever system, whatever format we adopt for council, we just adopt across the board for our other commissions, just for simplicity's sake. 
yeah, I agree with that. Whatever we're doing is probably good for everyone else as a model. See, Mr. Rudin's phone is active. Did you have a comment? Uh, no, sir, I, oh. I do not. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. All right, sounds like uh, we've got the direction we need on that. Let's go ahead then to item two, next item of new business, which is discussion and consideration of amending section one of the city regulations for meetings regarding the regular meeting time. Um, do we have a staff report on that? Thank, thank you, Mayor. Um, just a quick overview. According to 1697, our meetings rules and regulations how we conduct our public meetings the city currently has the first and third tuesday of the month 7 p.m as a regular scheduled council meeting and i believe it is the desire of council to discuss whether that meeting time should be amended and that is the purpose of placing this on the agenda this evening all right thank you and um, i think one concern was potentially accommodating mr rudin the other is accommodating staff as well as our council members. So um, any questions about this? Otherwise I will use the same procedure as last time uh, and open it to public comment. So we can come back and combine uh, the discussion of questions and comments simultaneously. Seeing no objection to that, I'm going to go ahead and open public comment on item two. Do we have any members of the public wishing to be heard regarding city council meeting times? So please raise your hand to be recognized. Seeing none, we will close public comment and return this now to questions, comments, and discussion by council regarding the meeting start time. And uh, I guess I'll, I'll start this out by um, uh, inviting uh, Mr. Rudin to comment if, if he was part of this and has opinions about start times. Um, any comment, Mr. Rudin? Uh, no, I, I think I don't have any particular preference with respect to start time. Uh, the only potential hardship that I would have is if we're having in-person meetings. Um, I also have an in-person meeting in Tahoe. Uh, that happens to be the first Wednesday. It's a board meeting of a 14 member board. Uh, and so it, because that meeting is actually in the early afternoon, I would have to immediately drive from Monte Sereno after our city council meeting on the first Tuesday, um, you know, back to Tahoe. So that's, that is really the concern. If I'm participating in those meetings from, you know, uh, virtually or, you know, uh, remotely, I, I think that it's a non-issue. Um, uh, but otherwise, you know, to address that, you know, the council could meet either second and fourth Tuesday or, um, you know, on some other day, uh, just to try and help me out here with that potential conflict. All right, thank you. That may be something that we we address at a further date, unless there's consensus that there's a desire to change uh, the actual dates. So, uh, Ms. Lawler? Well, it sounds like to me that, that if I'm not mistaken, Mr. Rudin, that it's only the first Wednesday, right? The, your Tahoe meeting is once a month, correct? That's correct. So then we were talking in the, on the previous item that um, with with the potential for you to zoom, you know, be remote one meeting and be present in another meeting, I would imagine then this, this really sort of a non-issue that we don't need to, we don't need to change the time. Yeah, that would be fine. Okay. Okay. Cause my concern is why was it set to be seven to begin with? Right. I mean, obviously it's to allow people who work to get home in time to participate whether they're on council or they're the public, right? So adjusting it to be earlier might be problematic. I, I'm just, you know, just want to make sure we understand why it was set at seven to begin with. That's all. I mean, I don't have any issue one way or the other. I just feel like maybe it's just not necessary. Yeah. Um, and, and let me let me offer my own um, recollection and thoughts on the seven o'clock set. I believe at some point it may have actually been earlier. I think it was to accommodate traffic. Uh, working uh, people um, on the council and also to allow a, a long enough break before the meeting so that staff and council members could eat before the meeting because meetings often do run, run quite a while. So I think, uh, I think the seven kind of made sense in the old world for all of those reasons um, and, and certainly not necessary in these times of hybrid meetings and remote meetings necessarily 
um, the same way. But I think all of those same considerations of our staff may want to uh, go home and or have a proper meal and a break between their work day and the meetings um, as, as well as um, our own members. So, um, and, and traffic, we don't know what's gonna happen with traffic in the future as well, but that was also an issue for people who had jobs that they left at five and still needed to get back to Monte Serena. So I, I don't have a strong opinion either way. I think a, a potential to pull it a little bit earlier from my just personal perspective would be fine probably to pull it as early as 6.30, but I wouldn't have any trouble leaving it at seven either for the actual in-person meetings where we need to get ourselves to the city hall. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think this discussion can go either way. At, at this point, you could move it to six thirty or six six p.m. I think for the staff's perspective, I don't know if any of the staff actually goes home and then comes back, um, because most of them don't live in Montecina. I don't believe. So if they're just staying around, they're probably better off if they get it over with and can leave earlier. So from you know, it may be worth doing a, a poll of the staff people to see what time works for them. Uh, from my perspective, even six o'clock is fine. And uh, that way we can get done earlier and our midnight meetings will end at 11 p.m. I guess, rather than at midnight. So that, that might be an incentive to get it done that way. I think they'll still go to midnight. There's a natural <laughs> tendency to fill the available time. <laughs> All right. But, but I think I think you make a good point. So um, Ms. Lawler, your hand is up. Yeah, I just, just, I just wanna make one point though, is that, I mean, I, while I don't mind, mind six o'clock, I, I am concerned about the fact that most of, our, most of our residents understand our meetings to be at seven o'clock. I, I just don't want a time change to inhibit participation by the public in any way. So I want this to be, if we're not, if it's not, if it's not fixed, if it's not broken, don't fix it kind of thing. So I don't see why we're even tinkering with this at this point. That's, I sort of feel. Yep, I, I agree with what you're saying and that was well said. Um, and I'm, not, I'm not hearing anybody seeing any, uh, advocating strongly for a change. So I guess the question would really come back to Mr. Leonardis if, if he and staff are advocating for a change, we'll need to hear that from, from him and staff. And, and take that input and work with it. Mr. Mekicek has joined us and has his hand up. Go ahead. Hi, I can't see my uh, picture on the screen here, but um, most city council meetings in Lascado, Saratoga, Cupertino, et cetera, I believe they're all 7, 7 p.m. So that is the norm. And uh, I think it's okay to be flexible on a periodic basis uh, in terms of moving a meeting time from seven to 6.30 and, and maybe as early as six, but I would be reticent to move it from the 7 p.m. And I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear what uh, city attorney uh, Rudin said and and I know he's got an issue with a conflict time commitment to make it to Tahoe or back or whatever. But those are my thoughts. Yeah, and we, we talked earlier about that. Um, if he's gonna be able to participate remotely in one meeting a month, um, it, that's really less of an issue um, be, to get back because we can have him participate remotely at least one meeting a month and then do some staff time and office hours around his other time to make it worthwhile for him to come down to, to our little town. So, um, but uh, another point actually to add to this um, with the, the industry standard maybe being seven o'clock, we can't just randomly pull our meetings earlier because these are standardized. Uh, yeah. And we talked about that last time, but it, this does give us the opportunity to put a special meeting in prior uh, when, when we need to have uh, closed sessions or special sets. Um, we can do that before the regular meeting at 7 p.m. And we have a little more flexibility to do that with the 7 p.m. start as, as we did today. So um, I think Ms. Lawler's comments of if it's not broken, don't, don't fix it are probably fine. Um, we're not hearing any strong advocate for change again, unless Mr. Leonardis and staff come to us and say they would really prefer something different. Then of course we're open to input. Any further comments or direction on that? Otherwise I think, I think we've provided some guidance 
Seeing none, um, Mr. Leonardis, is that okay uh, with you? Uh, kind of dynamically get back to us if this is an issue if for staff or if you have strong suggestions, but otherwise uh, quite possibly leaving us as is. Thank you, Mayor. Yes, um, I have heard nothing from our staff. So um, we are at this point in agreement with leaving the time unchanged if that's what council wants to do. All right, great, thank you. Um, so let's go ahead and move to the next item on the new business calendar. That's item three. Uh, Mr. Mekachek has joined us, so we don't need to move this. Uh, this is to provide discussion and direction regarding uh, Monte Serino City Council's previous submission to the California PUC, protesting the water rate increase by San Jose Water Company. Um, so um, number one, um, we can turn to either a staff report, and if that's Mr. Mekachek who's delivering that, that's fine. Um, I would note that we do have Mr. Tang in the audience uh, as well. If uh, he wishes to address the council, he can do so during public comment. If people have questions for him, um, I would assume that he might make himself available if we had any questions that we wanted to direct his way. So uh, let's go ahead with the staff report introduction of this item, then we'll open public uh, work. Council questions, we'll open public comment and return to council discussion. Thank you, Mayor. So just a brief introduction again, um, we drafted a staff report regarding the background information uh, behind what uh, Council Member Mekachek has done on behalf of the city and what he needs from the council to um, present the city um, the council's uh, position going forward. So I believe you have all read that staff report rather than reiterate what is in there. I will just say, um, introduce the item to council member Mekachek for further questions at this point and or Mr. Rudin. All right, Mr. Rudin, did you have any comments that you wanted to make in the introduction to this? And uh, then we'll, after you, we'll turn to Mr. Mekachuk if he wants to do any introduction of this item before we go to public comment and discussion. So Mr. Rudin? I, I, I do not have any comments on this item. All right, thank you. Mr. Mekachuk, did you want to do anything more by way of introduction of this item? And you're on mute. And you're still on mute. I'm sorry, took myself off mute. Um, I believe that uh, we city council agreed unanimously to send that letter to the CPUC. And, you know, it. what I learned subsequent to that is that's an input, but it's not part of the, of testimony. And while the administrative law judge would maybe look at that, that doesn't become part of the proceeding. And to become part of the proceeding, you actually have to write a, either uh, an oral uh, statement or a written statement. And it's not entirely clear to me what, what is required, but um, I prepared a written statement that was as myself and that was submitted uh, to the administrative law judge and for me to A, be presented as a witness and then B, to have that as my written testimony. And uh, San Jose Water Company categorically said no, uh, council member Mekichuk should not, or actually Mr. Mekichuk should not be a witness. They object to that and they said, uh, we also object to the written testimony. So this is in front of the administrative law judge and is, it is up to her to either accept that or not. And then the, the second part of that is that there's another party and that's called the, the public advocates office and they have no, no objections to me being either a witness or submitting, submitting my written testimony, which you all have. Um, and I believe at our last city council meeting, Mayor Luthold, you were talking about uh, uh, a letter as well from someone and, and they wanted you to sign something. And whether you sign it, you can say, 
uh, Sean Luthold, comma, mayor of Monte Serino, but that's different than Sean Luthold speaking as mayor of Monte Serino on behalf of Monte Serino. So uh, to some extent, I believe it would be um, beneficial and my testimony would carry more weight if I was speaking on behalf of the city of Monte Serino, but logistically we have a little bit of an issue with that. But I believe that if I, if I uh, stay within the, what my written testimony was and the letter that we, we unanimously signed and agreed to, uh, and, I, and I stay within that, then I would request uh, the city of Monte Serino um, allow me to do that, the council members. But should you not wish to, to approve that, then I can speak as Brian Mekachuk, comma, council member of Monte Serino. Those are my comments. All right, thank you. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, open this to public discussion first and then return to uh, detailed council questions and comments. So um, do we have any members of the public wishing to be recognized to speak on this uh, item three? If so, please raise your hand to be recognized. Seeing none, we will close public comment and return this now to council discussion. So, um, and, and Mr. Ritter. Council Member Mekachuk, if I can ask you a question, is there a particular deadline by which the council needs to take action on this item? Uh, I do not believe there is a deadline, but uh, because it has already gone to the administrative law judge, and I believe that I haven't seen if the San Jose Water Company has submitted any written objections to that yet. And I believe they have 15 days from the submission. And I, I believe that to be the case. And I don't know if that deadline has passed or not. I suspect it has not. Um, the so, so if I if I understand correctly, the 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 San Jose Water Company would need to make some sort of uh, objection before the administrative law judge, and then uh, you would have the opportunity. Um, I, I, I've gathered the office of the uh, ratepayer advocate has no concerns uh, one way or the other about your particular testimony or your ability to testify. Um, I and so. I guess what you're asking for is um, for the council to authorize you to represent the city as um, uh, you know it, as you are making your testimony. That is correct. All right. Thank you. Um, any uh, council member questions that you'd like to direct at this uh, topic, either to Mr. Oh, Mekachek I'm, or council? Oh, I'm sorry. Mayor, Mayor Luthold, yep. uh, if I recall, there was a letter or an email from someone saying that they would advocate me speaking on behalf of the city. I'm not sure if that was included. All right. Okay, thank you. Um, council questions, comments? Ms. Lawler, saw your hand first. <laughs> Quicker, thank you. Um, Yes, Council Member Mekachuk. Um, I believe that was Lon Allen who actually wrote that correspondence. But I, just just to be clear, um, by our uh, consenting to designate you as our spokesperson, will this strengthen the testimony in any way? Is this going to benefit the city? I, be I believe it would. It would because I would be speaking on behalf of more people explicitly versus just for lack of a better word, a concerned citizen. All right, okay, thanks. Okay, uh, Mr. Alahi. Thank you. Uh, I, I must commend uh, Council Member Brian Mekachek. I think you've done a lot of work to put this together and it really has some very uh, interesting information. Uh, I'm kind of surprised how much, how many items the San Jose Water Company wants to uh, file as confidential. And I don't get it. I mean, this is supposed to be a public uh, forum the San Jose Water Company is a public company. 
I would think everything they do, they, they, you know, they have to disclose. There is no competition, so it's not like you're hiding something from your competitors. So who are they hiding this? I, their ideas from, from the customers, from the residents. Secondly, from the city's perspective, uh, our residents have told us several times and uh, numerous occasions that uh, whatever the centers, the rates of San Jose Water Company charges are excessive and we should be objecting to those rates. And I think uh, our city should be, should, should, is, should, should be behind your testimony and uh, agree with whatever uh, it needs to be done to lower the rates because really, as you point out, uh, the, the water company is benefiting from its relationship with the subsidy. I guess the San Jose Water Group and the San Jose Water Company uh, it generates the cash and they benefit from it. They're, uh, you know, we've, as you pointed out, their executives are making um, you know, quite, quite a few times more than they were before. I don't know if it's 20 times or 30 times more than they were doing a few years ago. And they also benefit from all the cash that the water company generates and apparently it, it's lent up to their uh, to the San Jose Water Group at a ridiculously low interest rate, like 1.55%. I mean, if they have to borrow money from the bank, I was, you, know, you would think that they'd have to pay more for that. So uh, for all those reasons, I think the rates are higher than they would be. Uh, and, 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 and the rates that they've generated from their customers are basically used to acquire other water companies elsewhere. So, so I, I think we should back uh, Council Member Mekchek's uh, evidence and uh, have uh, the have it considered by the P, the, so the the PUC and have them also consider the letter that the city initially sent so it'd be like part of the same uh, testimony. So thank thank you, Council Member Mekchek, for all the effort you put into this. Thank you, um, Ms. Turner. Any comments? Nope. Okay. Um, let me add my voice to this as well. Um, and, and that is, I mean, I think, uh, again, um, thank you, Mr. Mekachuk, for the dedication and the hard work you've put in on this. Um, I, um, and I really appreciate you taking the message to the CPs, you see, um, to, to give them some backbone, uh, to remind them of their duty to protect the citizens of the state of California and the district here um, in this hearing. Uh, many times uh, citizens have complained of the cozy relationship uh, between the CPUC and those they are supposed to control. Uh, the um, the uh, moving out of CPUC positions into advocacy positions for the very things that uh, companies that they used to control. Um, I mean, these things are all inappropriate and we, we need to stand up as citizens. We need to make sure that our citizens, as council members uh, and as a council, that our citizens' concerns are heard. Um, deputizing you uh, as, as our uh, person and spokesperson to take these messages that we have very clearly uh, as a city uh, heard and passed along, I think is completely appropriate. So I am very comfortable adding my voice to, to this and saying, within the scope of what you've outlined, the letters that we've made and what you've revealed to us, um, your testimony would be, um, I'm certainly comfortable with you um, and with us officially uh, passing a resolution that you have that power to speak on behalf of the city within those bounds. So I'm comfortable um, putting forth that uh, resolution to approve that and, and to give you the power to speak on behalf of the city. So I'll make that motion if uh, we don't need further discussion about it. Mr. Rudin, is that okay? Um, just in light of how this has been agendized as a discussion and direction item, um, to the extent that Mr. Mekachuk needs specific authority and doesn't sound like he needs it at this meeting, I think out of an abundance of caution, I would just, you know, put it on the consent calendar for next meeting, you know, approval of you know, Brian Mekachuk uh, to serve as city representative and we can add, you know, a brief letter say, you know, outlining that he's been approved to speak and on behalf of the city in this proceeding, um, consistent with the um, matters listed in the, looks like, what's the date on this letter? June 16th, 2021 letter. Yes, as well as the, uh, the other uh, information regarding his testimony. So there's his letter and there's the earlier city letter. 
So um, it sounds like we'll, uh, yeah, Mr. Mekachek has the direction that he is moving that way. He could certainly let the CPUC know that uh, Monty Serino is uh, formally going to consider that at the next meeting, uh, but that we're moving that direction and, and he should be able to be formally recognized as the spokesman on this issue uh, very shortly. And I guess, um, Mr. Mekachek, I would point out if, if for some reason there is a deadline that is more urgent, uh, bring this back. We can call a quick special meeting if you needed to uh, make that official at an earlier date. I appreciate that. And I do not believe that there will be uh, any sense of urgency beyond our next meeting. So if this was on the resolution was on the consent calendar at the next meeting, I believe that timing will, will work out extremely well. And if not, I will let you know at my very first opportunity. All right, thank you. And then work with Mr. Rudin on the uh, exact content of the consent calendar item. Mr. Lahi, is your hand still up? Yeah, I, I was just curious. Uh, uh, Mr. Tang is uh, an attendee. And I was just curious if Mr. Tang had any comments on uh, uh, Councilmember Mekachek's uh, uh, evidence, uh, something he wanted to share or give us a reason as to why you know, maybe that is something City Council should not do. And I'd like to consider all sides to it. So if, 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 Council, if uh, Mr. Tang would care to elaborate, we'd like to hear from him. If not, that's a plan. All right, so um, and in, as we've closed public comment already, um, I can reopen public comment and give him the opportunity to do so. Uh, he hasn't raised a hand yet, um, but uh, would uh, Council uh, like me to reopen public comment and, yes. uh, and then inquire of Mr. Tang if he would like to make a comment? Do we, uh, I would like that if he would, if Mr. Tang would so desire. Okay, and Ms. Lawler, is that an okay to reopen public comment for that purpose? Okay, um, I've got uh, three nods, so I will reopen public comment um, to give Mr. Tang an opportunity to uh, speak to that issue if he so desires. Uh, Mr. Tang, if you'd like to, please raise your hand. If you uh, don't want to, that's fine. Okay, you've raised your hand. We will recognize you for three minutes. If you need longer than that, we can uh, entertain that, but please try to keep your comments brief. Uh, yes, I'll try to keep my comments brief. I'm sorry for the background noise. I'm here at home, uh, just like you all are. Right, good evening, Mayor and, and Council members. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to address you on this. Uh, you know, From my perspective, from the company perspective, I think the city providing input to the process uh, is fine. Um, you know, you've already done that through uh, the letter that you sent. And, uh, you know, I understand, and I may be mistaken in this, that um, uh, Council Member Mechchuk, either as a council member uh, representing the council or uh, as himself, is uh, also um, a member of rates or is uh, somebody who's going to be working with rates. Uh, to provide further input into the uh, GRC process. And so uh, that, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's your prerogative. You're cer certainly welcome to, uh, uh, welcome to do that. Uh, I did want to address one other thing, and that is, uh, you know, you mentioned about affordability and you mentioned about high rates. Um, I did send the council uh, several emails on the afford affordability issue now. I've sent uh, you the report from the PUC that speaks specifically to affordability, not me saying something is affordable, but the PUC saying something is affordable. I hope you found that information informative. Uh, I have rate studies, bill studies of local area utilities that I can share with you. I think I've already done that. I hope you found that stuff uh, informative as well. And uh, you know, hopefully that will uh, inform uh, ultimately whatever uh, input you provide uh, to the commission in this proceeding. Thank you. All right, Mr. Tang, thank you for your input. Uh, if we have any other members of the public wishing to be recognized, please go ahead and raise your hand and uh, we'll see if uh, anyone wishes to address this issue. Seeing none, uh, I will close public comment again, return this finally if there are any final uh, council comments. Otherwise, it sounds like we have the direction we need uh, on this item. Seeing none, uh, we will complete item three and move now to item four which is discussion and direction on the City Enforcement Hearing Board. Um, Mr. Leonardis, uh, do you have a staff report on that? 
Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, we have in our city code the uh, the concept of a review panel. We have uh, in our city currently a construction project where no permits, planning, or building were were pulled. We uh, sent the building uh, inspector out there to uh, inspect what was going on, issued a stop work order. The stop work order was disobeyed. And let's let's not get into the details of the particular okay. project. I, I, I think at this point, what we need from the council um, is the city, city code um, provides um, for an enforcement uh, hearing board. Um, you know, by law, the city has certain code enforcement powers and powers to enforce its ordinances, including building standards, uh, zoning requirements, and just about any other law the city would like to pass. However, due process requires that the city have an appeal provision whenever the city issues administrative citations or uh, undertakes nuisance abatement actions. Um, the code uh, provides that it will be the council members who are selected to serve on the enforcement hearing board shall serve on the enforcement hearing board. Uh, it also provides that the city manager is empowered to uh, prescribe rules and procedures for the enforcement hearing board. Uh, however, um, the city manager and I researched what rules and procedures the city may have with respect to this hearing board and discovered that we could not locate any. Um, in particular, we are um, hopeful that the council can provide some feedback on uh, the number uh, of uh, council members uh, who would like to serve um, and, um, you know, the manner of selection. Um, typically, with these types of administrative appeals, um, in most jurisdictions, there'll be uh, a separate board of building appeals um, because that's required under state law. Uh, and if the city doesn't have one, the city council serves as the building board of appeals. Um, Typically, you'll either have a standalone board or you'll have administrative appeals considered by uh, volunteers um, or you'll have uh, a hearing officer that's specifically appointed. So it is a little unusual to actually have councils uh, in most cities consider administrative appeals. But given that this is what our code provides, um, and, you know, we need to establish the exact process by which um, we uh, do that. Um, now, there is no reason that the entirety of the council would have to be involved in every administrative appeal, um, but it's something the council can decide is appropriate. Um, if there's less than the entire council, then council members could be selected on a rotating basis just to share the load. Um, although I have been here almost two years now, and this is the first appeal that we have received, um, and, um, you know, it's unclear whether or not it'll actually proceed to an appeal and a hearing. Um, but regardless of whether it does, the city does need to have uh, a process in place for selecting council members and for, um, you know, deciding how appeals will be considered and scheduled. So right. with, with that, I'll, I'll take any questions. All right, um, so let's do council member questions um, and then we will get uh, through the questions. Um, but again, we do have to do public comment at some point. So let's focus on questions at this point. Ms. Turner. Uh, yes, I wanted to ask um, our city attorney whether uh, the people on the board, this hearing board can be site and architecture. To me, it would make sense that, that uh, some of them would, would be able to volunteer for this? Um, not as the code is written as presently. One of the reasons why we're having discussion and direction is the council can consider to, you know, that to provide direction that uh, we change the code on this subject. Hmm. Um, but as, as at present, the code requires that it be council members. Okay. All right, um, Ms. Slaller. Well, my question was somewhat similar. Can we change this? It it makes more sense that most of the cities that I've looked at have uh, commissions or uh, enforcement boards that are made up of residents. And um, so it's interesting that we would have council members doing this. So maybe we can change this. Um, 
given that there's only been one appeal in the two years you've been here, whatever we create would only meet on an as needed basis, I'm assuming. So I would, I would be open to perhaps changing our code to involve members of either other commissions or members of the public. All right, thank you. Other council member comments? Mr. Mekicek, anything? Yes. And you're on mute. There you go. Sorry. Um, there's a couple of things. First of all, I wouldn't want to quote burden the site and architectural commission anymore. Our their meetings are pretty involved and they require a fair amount of work and those are volunteers. And I know that I think a few of them have are coming up to be reappointed. And um, I wouldn't want to have them do something that they would not prefer to do. Um, having said that, uh, you know, we're the peaceful mountain. We should try not to have something so that people can complain and appeal. And, you know, like I would really look to staff to try to reduce the amount of, of appeals that would go through. And I'm pretty sure it hasn't been only two years. I think it's been longer than that since we've actually had an, a, an appeal because when I looked at that, uh, I could find zero history um, with respect to uh, how you file a, an appeal. So um, I wonder if there's, if we have to have city council members do this, you know, we appoint one or two or three or whatever the number is, and we just get this behind us and kind of move on. Um, and if it was, if it comes up again, then that says something about the peaceful mountain. And then we can start to determine how to change our ordinances and, and put, a, put a structural change in place and then think about what the composition of such an appeal board would be. All right, thanks. Um, and uh, Mr. Elahi? Uh, yeah, so a couple of questions. One is, uh, is there a Brown Act issue? If, if two council members are at the hearing board, or, or if three are on the hearing board, is there a Brown Act issue? Uh, the other question is, uh, if the hearing board is comprised of other people or not, not the majority of the council members, uh, let's say it's, it's non-council members, then do, you, do they get to then appeal from that hearing board to the council itself as, a, as the final appeal in the city so that they now have two appeals to worry about? Yeah, my, my thought is this hasn't happened enough. I don't think this would be a big load for the council to take. And the question really should be how many members they should appoint, whether it should be all five of the council members or just the three of us to do it. Uh, and as uh, Council Member Mikicek was uh, uh, talking about, if it doesn't happen that we get one every month, then yeah, then we'll have to get out of it and get somebody else involved. But uh, initially to get the process figured out and to uh, take out any kinks in the process, it may be better for the council directly to be involved in the appeal process so they can figure out what the route should be, what the procedure should be, because so it's going to develop as you go along and then uh, do the appeal and move on. Uh, but um, that, that may be the simplest and the best way to get going rather than have an appeal, bo uh, appeal board and then that appeal board gets to appeal to the city council anyway. All right, Mr. Rudin, any so comments on I, that? Um, I will answer the questions of of Brown Act. So because the enforcement hearing board that exists right now on paper in the city's code has been created by ordinance, it's a Brown Act body, regardless of the number of council members that you put on it, whether that's one or five. Um, so, you know, its meetings have to be, should be held in accordance with the, uh, with the Brown Act. So we would notice those as well. Um, and, you know, there's no confidentiality or anything like that, that people are entitled to you know, with respect to, you know, an administrative appeal. So um, those are typically open to the public. Um, if the city changes its process for appeals, um, you know, the code can provide that whoever makes, you know, whatever entity you delegate that to, whether it's an administrative hearing officer that exists, 
um, whether it's, uh, you know, a building board of appeals or whether it's the site and architecture commission or a similar other body that you create, whether it's a board comprised entirely of citizens who volunteer for that duty, um, the code can provide that that's the final decision of the city. Um, generally, the purpose of these is to ensure due process, give somebody the opportunity to contest the city's imposition of a fine and present evidence. Um, and for the city, the benefit is that they have to, you know, exhaust their administrative remedies and go through the appeal process and, you know, show their case uh, before they're allowed to sue. Uh, so, you know, it benefits both sides to have an appeal process when it comes to the city, um, you know, enforcing its, uh, you know, building and zoning ordinances via fines or via other means. Um, so, um, with respect to council member Lahi's concern, um, if we have this appeal handled, these types of appeals handled in the future by some other body, we can make sure that there's no potential for additional appeal after that. Um, if we have the council handle any, well, until we change it, the council is responsible for handling all of these appeals. Um, so the question is, is you know, whether or not you want to have fixed persons who are appointed to this type of body um, or whether they should be selected on a rotating basis and really um, whether you want to have five of them, five, five members on the body or some other number. All right, thank you. Ms. Lawler, uh, further questions? I, uh, you know, it's a comment, so I'll, I'll, okay. I'll wait that's, for it. Great, let's come back to comments um, because I have to open public comment. Um, so, Ms. Turner, any questions? And you're on mute. You're still on mute. Would there it be go. possible, uh, our, uh, Mr. Rudin, whether uh, if we could actually have a board for a specific hearing and then for the next one, we change it as well? So we have it on an as needed basis. Uh, so what you're suggesting is a appointment process that is rotating yeah. uh, is what it sounds like. Yeah, yeah that is possible. Uh, okay. If that's what the council would like to do for these types of appeals. So it's not the same council members. And, you know, additionally, um, because council members, you know, um, may be required to recuse. So, for example, if you're considering a neighbor, you know, your neighbor's appeal, um, chances are you're not going to be allowed to participate in that. So if you have less than a less than the entire council, you know, that allows us to rotate council members who are affected out of considering that kind of appeal. OK, so that's one option. That is one option. Yes. Um, if you select the entire council, obviously an affected council member would just simply recuse. Yes. All right. Thank you. Uh, if there are no further questions, let's go ahead and open this to public comment. If we have any members of the public wishing to speak, please raise your hand now to be recognized. Seeing no hands, uh, we will close public comment and return this to council member discussion. Uh, and I'm gonna go ahead and uh, jump in with uh, one of my comments first here on this, um, because um, I think it's uh, potentially important here in such a small city uh, where this is so infrequent, um, it feels to me like due process is allowing someone who has a grievance and a concern about how they've been treated in the enforcement process to come before the five members of council and make sure that we've all heard them and acted on it. So, so my comfort level would be in giving them that rather than them saying it's less than and maybe somehow biased or it's a member of the public who might have an agenda pro or against some issue. Um, I think we've even heard we debatement stuff come back to council and it's not like it's a terrible burden, but it certainly lets people know they've been heard when they can stand up in front of that council at the podium and, and be heard. So that's my thought on it. And uh, with that, let's go to Ms. Lawler's comments. Well, that actually makes perfect sense. So that keeps it easy. It keeps it simple. It keeps it all under one roof. We're not worrying about council members having to recruit, you know, a, a quorum for that matter. So I, I actually completely agree with that. And I, the point that I was going to make was that this is something that probably requires some subject matter expertise. So we do have a couple of lawyers. Um, we would need, you know, someone who's 
you know, obviously commenting on engineering or structural, you know, building kind of thing. So we need to make sure that we have all of that information at our at our availability as well. Yeah, and, and just just for council's background, so these types of appeals, you know, the council serves as a judge, um, usually city staff uh, and the code enforcement officer and whoever else is supporting them, whether that's the city engineer, the building official, uh, the city's planner, um, you know, are there making a prosecutorial case. So you have, it, it, it's, it's basically an adverse proceeding. You have staff who are making the case that there's been a violation um, and, you know, the appellant who will be making the case that there is not a violation um, and each side will have the opportunity to present evidence and, you know, uh, testimony. Um, and basically the council's job is to act as an impartial judge and say, yes, yes, there has been a violation or no, there hasn't. And then to impose or not impose a penalty as well as, you know, prescribe a schedule for compliance. So those, those that that would typically be the council's duty on these types of matters. Okay, so so one one procedural question then is is, is if council is is going to be the um, the enforcement board, then will it have a meeting at a separate time other than normal council meetings? Will it be noticed as an enforcement board meeting? Yes, it would be. Okay, thank you. All right, Mr. Mekacek, you had your hand up briefly and then you put it down. Did you have comments? Yes, my, my comment is, would it be a, I would prefer it not to be a city council meeting. I would, and I'm wondering if it was not a city council meeting, if it would be in a closed session or would it be, would that hearing be open to the public and, and perhaps the city attorney could respond to that question. It would be a meeting noticed as a meeting of the Enforcement Hearing Board, and um, it would be open to the public. Okay. Although That's fine. I am doubtful that anybody would be that interested if, unless that appeal particularly affected them. I'm with you. I would, uh, I would just not like to see it burden a council meeting because that's a different audience and whatever yes it, it it would be the it would be the council members having to show up but to a different meeting all right um further questions and comments okay mr alahi uh any question or comment no i i, I think we also have to be on board you know city council can move forward with it and uh i don't know what other regulations we need to add to streamline the procedure or if uh, just uh, if those have to be drafted or drawn up. And then yeah, I so, I guess and I... those, so beyond those issues, I don't think the council needs to weigh in at this time uh, with respect to other procedural matters. The code provides that the city manager has, has the duty and responsibility to prepare those. Um, and obviously our office will advise on that, um, you know, to ensure that uh, the procedures are Procedures um, and process is neutral, um, impartial, and complies with uh, due process. So, so are those procedures going to come before us for adoption? No, the city manager has the authority to adopt them directly. All right. Mm -hmm. So, but are they going to get published or printed somewhere so the litigants know about them? Uh, yes, uh, they'll be. Once they are prepared, they'll be prepared, provided to appellants, and they'll be provided to the council members. Um, and I assume. Um, to the extent that we need to put them on the website, we can also put them on the website. Excellent. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, so, so if, if we do have, uh, this is an advisory discussion, if we do have nods to the full council participating for the foreseeable future, um, Mr. Rudin, do you think we need to clarify the uh, city regulations regarding that to say that it will be the full council or are we fine leaving it as drafted with simply the understanding that for now it's going to be the full council unless this becomes a burden and then we'll revisit it uh, but we wouldn't need to change the existing language um, at this point or would we 
I don't think we need to make a modification to the municipal code. Um, I think this matter can be addressed in the procedural rules that the city manager has authority to adopt. All right, thank you. And Mr. Mekacek, did you have your hand up again? Yeah. Yes. Um, what would the notice period be for the hearing? So how much notice would council have for the hearing? That is a great question. Um, and that is something the council can certainly have some feedback on. Yeah, and that's something that we probably, I mean, it, it would be part of the procedures, uh, which the city manager and city attorney with the city attorney helping are going to spell out. Um, but obviously I think we need to balance um, that as, as we go forward uh, so that someone is who has perhaps made an error and not pulled a permit and has something that they're facing can get a reasonably timely hearing, but certainly not rewarded for bad behavior, but not, not put out an unreasonable length of time at the same time. So I think that's something that, that we'll have to look at the practical procedures as Mr. Leonardis and Mr. Rudin put that together. Yes, and you know, oftentimes somebody may file an appeal uh, and there may be a stipulation to defer the hearing date. Um, you know, while the parties reach some sort of settlement or agreement to resolve whatever the violation is. Um, so that's that's not uncommon in code enforcement practice. Um, so, but uh, I think I think Council Member Mekachuk's question is, is how much notice should the council get before the hearing? And I would not expect it to be anything less than 10 days. Um, so the council has so that the enforcement hearing board has the opportunity to you know, prepare and review any materials, you know, review written submissions. Um, you know, I, I think those are the sort of things that would be spelled out in procedural rules. And in those procedurals, would you say what if the hearing appeals board is made up of council and there's five members on council, what would a quorum be for the appeals hearing board yes and then what would a decision be of the quorum uh yes that that is that is certainly something to address in in the in in those exact rules um typically for these types of administrative appeals the city bears the burden of proof um so you know the city has to demonstrate a violation by preponderance of the evidence um and so, you know, if you can't get an affirmative majority vote of the council members, you know, I, I would expect the procedural rules to lay out that that's, you know, not sufficient for establishing a violation. The citation should be overturned. Um, so. All right. Sounds like, sounds like we'll get to see all of that. And, and if for some reason we're uh, council is either having questions or comments, once those rules are developed, that is within the city manager's authority to do. But if council sees them and, and wants to provide further input, we can certainly address that when we when the time comes. But uh, chances are we can follow models that have been done before, simplified for our simple community, probably. All right, uh, it sounds like we've got direction on that, which is what the goal was here. Um, and uh, so if there's nothing further, we will go ahead and uh, close that item and move to what's next. So uh, that is committee and commission reports. Anyone have committee and commission reports they would like to present? Seeing none, I will just comment uh, for Mr. Mekacek's uh, knowledge here. Um, I was supposed to attend as the alternate on the VTA. Uh, I attempted to join that meeting and um, they had not provided a viable link for me to be able to get into the meeting. They may or may not have provided a link to you, uh, but I'm assuming they didn't need me for a quorum. I was available online if they reached out to me, uh, but uh, since they didn't, I didn't attend that meeting. So you may want to, uh, if it's important on any of the items there, you might want to review the tape just to see what happened at that meeting since I can't tell you. Thank you, appreciate that. Okay, uh, seeing uh, no one's hand up. Oh, there's one, Ms. Turner, go ahead. I, I wanted to just update the council quickly 
on the uh, airport round table. Uh, and I wanted to, to, to let you know that we had a, a session that was, that was a, a little bit controversial. Um, the airport, uh, we, we uh, council member Lawler and I were the representatives on the airport. And I don't know if you remember, we said we don't need to join, join that group because many of, of the airport noise is not something that Montessorino can control. Uh, the funds that come from the airport, that goes to the airport comes from the cities that are part of, of that group. Uh, about a few months ago, we had a, um, a contractor who sued the round table for uh, employee harassment. And as a result of that, they, they wanted the cities, all the cities to pay for the lawyer's fees on that harassment charge. And uh, last week, I voted as part of the group uh, because we, we said we weren't gonna be members of that group that we were not going to pay for that suit. So I just wanted you to know that in case they come back at you and say, why did you do this? So that's my report. Right, thank you. Um, and uh, Mr. Lahi, you've got your hand up. You're next. And you're on mute. Uh, yeah, I, I thought I'd share something important that is coming down with, as far as the clean energy concerns and the climate change concerns are. There's a initiative called the ZEV, ZEV 2030 initiative to, which, to encourage widespread electrical vehicle adoption. And the Silicon Valley Clean Energy has adopted that. Uh, the initiative's goal is 100% zero emission vehicle sales by 2030. And uh, that's you know the, the ZEV 2030 initiative, which is a California initiative. That's the goal is. And I think what will be coming down the pipeline is uh, uh, providing cities with information regarding that so the cities can act and uh, reduce uh, emissions as much as possible. Um, if you remember, we did the REACH codes. Uh, there's REACH 2.0 codes that are coming, going to be coming down the pipeline, which have to do with uh, uh, the, the, the codes that we adopted really had to do with new buildings. Now there's, a, you know, there's obviously the, the climate uh, concerns are really magnified now because we have apparently reached a point where uh, we may not be able to reverse what's happening. So. Uh, initiatives have to be taken to reduce, uh, reduce the burden on the climate. Uh, so some, some codes are, uh, that are going to be considered would have to do with what happens with existing buildings when they're modified and how they're changed. So I just thought I'd give you a heads up on it and there'll probably be more information that comes out on that. All right, thank you. Any other uh, committee commission reports? Seeing none, let's go ahead and move to council member comments. Any uh, council member comments? Ms. Turner, you got your hand up first and you're on mute. I wanted to ask about Saturday, the picnic. Uh, and this is, a, uh, this is a question for Mr. Leonardis. Do we need to wear masks at the picnic? Thank you, council member Turner. First of all, the picnic is Sunday this year. Sunday, yes. And it's 11. <laughs> 11.30 to two, so if you come, please come on Sunday. <laughs> um, regarding <laughs> yes, the masks, Sunday. the uh, county health order does not require us to wear masks outside. However, as precaution, if individuals wish to do that and, and keep social distance, of course, those are always good practices, especially with the Delta variant out there, but the current county health order does not require masking outdoors. Okay, I have another question, and that has to do with C-click fix. Uh, at the picnic, it would be a good thing for Mayor Luthold to actually get the residents to upload the, the app on their cell phone. Is that ready? Thank you for the question. I was going to address that in manager's report. So oh, okay. we, are, we are, I believe, going to have all of our communications ready so we can officially roll out C-Click Fix 
Thursday or Friday this week. So keeping our fingers crossed that we get that all done. We do have postcards that we will be handing out at the picnic showing how to uh, download the app. So um, we will be passing those out to residents as well as all the other goodies we'll be passing out at our booth. So um, it will be a matter of uh, days, maybe week or two before uh, residents will be fully up and, and able to use C Click Fix. We're very excited about this. Thank you. Right, great. Uh, anything else on your list, Ms. Turner? No, it looks like not. You went to mute. Okay, Mr. Mechachuk. Um, thank you. I will not be there on Sunday, but I see that it's going to be kind of a, a cooler day, not a burning hot day. And uh, I'm disappointed that I won't be there, but I want to uh, wish everyone the best uh, and have a great picnic. You can come great. on Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, I'm looking forward to having your share of the barbecue, so you're welcome to not come. Go for it. All right. Um, then uh, if nothing further, we'll move to uh, Mr. Lahi. Thank you. I, I was just curious uh, whether uh, we should be inviting some of the local politicians. I know uh, Mike Wasserman, I think this is his last year. Well, I guess maybe he'll term out, term out next next year uh, as our county, su uh, as our supervisor, county supervisor. And then you got low or assembly member and we need these guys on some of our housing issues and other issues. And this is a good time for them to come out and uh, meet with the people and you know we can express our viewpoints. So whether we should go ahead and send them and ex ex extend them an invitation to attend uh, uh, you know, the, the picnic and I think it'd be a good time. There's also some people who are running for offices, I think uh, you know, for, for, for county supervisors and other issues. So uh, I think at the least we should be inviting our assembly member, our state senator uh, and uh, our county supervisor. So I, I would recommend we send them out an invite if you haven't done that already. Yeah, and and I think Mr. Leonardo, I would add to that um, uh, other friends friends of Los, uh, of Monte Sereno, um, if you wanted to invite the other mayors and city managers, uh, if we have the ability to handle that, um, it's always nice to cement our relationships with those people further. And it really has been a long time since we've seen each other in person other than uh, a few of the rallies. So uh, if there's uh, any, um, if we're able and, and have uh, the ability to add those people in, uh, food, or food is adequate and so forth, um, maybe use your discretion to bring in people who are friends of Monte Serena. Yeah, and I'm also, last time this had, there was a picnic about two years ago, council members uh, pitched in and uh, used their muscle to help with uh, setting it up and all that. I, I, I guess uh, manager Leonardo is tough enough, he's going to do it all by himself. But if you need any help, please let us know. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. And I will be coordinating the logistics with the city clerk, uh, Michelle Radcliffe. And uh, I will send out an email and let you know. Of course, we all like um, support and help. And if you're willing to pitch in, we can certainly uh, certainly encourage that. So we welcome your help. Great, thank you. All right, I think I saw Ms. Lawler's hand up first and I see Ms. Turner as well. So Ms. Lawler first. Well, Mayor Pro Tem uh, beat me to it, I was gonna offer our help. And especially since we're expanding the guest list, um, I'm available to help out in any way. So please let me know. Um, I can run errands, I can haul things around. So happy to help. Great, thank you. And Ms. Turner's put her hand down. So uh, I think we're all good. Um, I'll, I will second, third that um, if anything is needed, I know in the past council has helped with cleanup. And I think even if we haven't been formally drafted for that, uh, we should plan accordingly to uh, help take things back, unloading them back at City Hall, cleaning up trash, those sorts of things, um, so that uh, we can help with any burden uh, there in real time on the spot. But if anything special is needed, um, and whether it's last minute or it's we're almost last minute now anyway, uh, reach out. We are all here and we'll obviously do our best to help 
make this successful. Um, one one comment: if we do end up inviting um, kind of the the politicians, politicians, uh, I would just suggest that we be careful that we don't give them a stage to take over. This is a picnic about ourselves and our staff and our residents. Uh, and uh, some of these professional politicians are more than happy to take over the microphone if it's offered to them. Uh, so we, we need to set that expectation that we're happy to have them mingle and circulate, but this is not a forum for them to uh, run for office. This is, this is for us to celebrate our citizens. Okay, so um, with uh, that, it looks like we've exhausted city council member comments, except I have one more since I've got the, the stage here, and that is Mr. Leonardis, Mr. Radcliffe. Um, I don't recall if we have a mayor's and managers meeting set for the following week. Uh, if so, uh, I trust you will uh, bring me in and get me an agenda so that uh, I can handle that uh, with your help. So, um, or, or if we do not have a mayors and managers for the month of August. Oh, one additional comment on that actually is um, Mr. Elahi would like to attend um, some of these to, uh, to see what goes on and to meet the people who are involved. So I wanted to reach out and extend the invitation to the next mayors and managers meeting to uh, bring in Mr. Elahi. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, and. Uh, uh, I know uh, Ms. Swet, uh, Michelle uh, Cliff is leaving, so I wanted to formally, we, we've thanked her in our closed session, but I want to formally thank her in our open session also to acknowledge all the great work she's done and how, how much she will be missed. And thank you for, you know, for everything you've done. And it looks like you've been drafted to do the picnic also. So that, that, that's really, uh, uh, really thankful for you to do, doing that and uh, wish you the best. Thank you. Yes, and, and um, uh, Mr. Mekicek, you've got your hand up. We'll go ahead and recognize you. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to make two comments. The first one uh, regarding the closed session, I was, if I recall correctly, you were to include my name in the closed session, Mayor Luthal. Yes, and I did mention when we opened okay. this one that you were there for approximately 45 minutes of the closed session before you needed to leave. Perfect, Perfect. thank you. Thank and you. then uh, my final comment is for uh, City Clerk Radcliffe. And I wanted to say that um, I always enjoyed seeing you smiling uh, at City Hall and at our council meetings. Uh, so thank you very much, and I wish you all the best. Thank you. Yep, yeah, and uh, I want to add my voice to that. Um, uh, this is um, our city clerk's last uh, formal meeting with us, um, and I want to recognize her, her exceptional uh, skills and performance for the city. Uh, we really appreciate that, and, and as Mr. Mekicek said, uh, the, the attitude that you brought to your job uh, thank you so much. It's been a great pleasure having you with uh, the city. Thank you. All right. Um, so uh, let's go ahead and move to city manager's report. And you muted yourself, Mr. Leonardis. There you are. Thank you, Mayor. Not much more to add than what had been previously discussed regarding the picnic. We look forward to seeing you all there. It is a little different format. We have food trucks coming this year, so um, we will be uh, enjoying the food. We have a taco truck, a uh, barbecue truck, and an ice cream truck. So um, we will be uh, looking forward to those and see how it, it turns out, but just a little bit different than what we ordinarily have. We still have all the booths from our uh, community agency partners and, and vendors. And we're in, uh, are we in the same location as before? Yes, it is called the Visona County Park Circle Site up there by the YSI area. Okay, uh, as, long as, as long as we know where to look, to, uh, going back where we've been in the past, that'll be great. And that'll be where people expect us. Do, do you have any idea of how many people are signed up or reserved? And how much, how, how, how many people are you setting up for? We have 142 RSVPs. 
um, but we have um, crew for about 160 people. We type that. All right. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Um, Mr. Green Artis, anything further? That is it. All right. Um, any council members want to bring anything up that we haven't already touched on with future agenda items? Seeing none, uh, if you have any, you can bring them to Mr. Leonardis and my attention and uh, city clerk or deputy city clerk's attention, and we will make sure to uh, get everything taken care of. So with that, uh, thank you very much. And I will now adjourn the meeting of the city council for Tuesday, August 17th. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night.